In this video, I'm going to review a couple of things needed for advanced high school physics uh, data analysis, and that's going to include creating a graph, adding a linear trend line, finding the slope of the trend line, and also I'm going to show you how to re just review how to do a linear regression analysis so that we can find the uncertainty and the slope, which we use, the value we use as uncertainty and slope is the standard error, right, the standard deviation in the slope. And then I'm going to show you how to find the percent error, the percent uncertainty, and your final experimental value. And then we're going to compare the experimental value we calculate to the actual value. And each of those will have uncertainty, so we'll look at whether, uh, we'll look at how to figure out whether those two values agree by comparing the two ranges set forth by the uncertainty. Okay, let's say I have something like this, and look, I've got this data, right? Um, these values, I, I've cooked the data, it's, it's, I generated these values so I have a good result, uh, or a decent result, and these cart masses I just uh, made up, everything is made up. Let's say I have these masses, right, cart 1, cart 2, and the block, and I measure the block and the cart 2 separate. I do the experiment where cart 2 is initially at rest, cart 1 has an initial velocity, cart 1 hits cart 2, I slam it into cart 2, they collide, they stick together, and they move at some final velocity, which is the same for the two carts. So there's just one final velocity. And let's say I want to center these, make them look a little nicer. And I take 25 trials, which is 24 trials, which is a good number of trials for an experiment with in, uh, varying initial velocities. Now look at this. I haven't included titles here or here. You want to fill those titles in as you see fit. Uh, my mass was measured with a mass balance, so this is the standard device uncertainty for the mass balances we used. And look, I check, and yes, the absolute uncertainty in mass is precise to the uh, hundredths place. So these values, these masses, which were collected using that device with this uncertainty, these measurements, then, should all be precise to the hundredths place as well. And when I say precise to the hundredths place, I mean that's where we've rounded. We've rounded this first value to the 5 here, the second decimal place, or the hundredths place. This is also rounded to the same hundredths place, and this as well. And that's matching the uh, where I've rounded the uncertainty. The uncertainty is precise to the hundredths place. So that matches, that's good. Uh-oh, I don't have any, look at this, I don't have any uh, units, I don't have any uncertainty, so I'll have to fix that. That's not good. First thing, we go to insert. We're going to insert a scatter plot. It's very important to make sure your plot is a scatter plot. Right? And we don't want any, let me delete, we don't want lines connecting the scatter plot data points. So we do scatter, and then we don't choose any of the others, we choose the first option. I'm going to put it here. We add data. The name doesn't matter. On our x-axis, we are going to use the final velocity. I have to delete this, delete, then I highlight the initial values, velocity values for my y-axis. I hit OK, I hit OK. Oh, look at how beautiful my data is. That is clearly fabricated data. Very obvious. OK. Uh, next thing I'm going to do is add a trend line. So I right-click on the data, I hit Add Trend Line. I want a linear that's pre-selected, that's good. Um, I don't want to set the intercept at zero. I want to display the equation and the r squared value. Again, the r squared value is, uh, I believe, the r, r is called the correlation coefficient, and it tells us how good of a fit. You know, you can think of it as how good of a fit is this line for this data. Is the line a good fit of the data, not a good fit? How well do particular x values predict the y values? Okay, so there's my slope. So look right here. I'm going to use this information to find the uncertainty in my experimental value of M2. And I need slope, so I'm going to go ahead and plug in 2.8663. Uh, let's not round anything here. There, good. But I need to know the uncertainty in this slope. That's one of the things needed to find the absolute uncertainty. Finding absolute, I should say. So to find the absolute uncertainty in my experimental M2 value, I need the uncertainty, the absolute uncertainty in slope. 
So I find that by going to data, data analysis, I scroll all the way down to regression, OK. Again, I choose for the Y and X ranges, I choose the same things I had just selected for my graph. So the Y range, again, is the initial velo uh, velocity values, and the X range, the final velocity values. I will put this in a new worksheet, so I click New Worksheet, I hit OK, here it is. The only values I care about in this whole output, this regression to output, are these bottom nine values, so I copy those, and I'm going to go back over to, whoops, over to here, and I'll paste those in to my, uh, I'll paste those into my spreadsheet here, and make sure I can see everything. Alright, maybe I want standard error, let's see, let me make, let me make this a little smaller, and make this a little bigger. And standard error, we know, is a way of measuring the uncertainty, the absolute uncertainty. We had discussed this. There's another video where I discuss the fact that standard deviation is just like the half range method for finding uncertainty, um, except just slightly different. We use a subset in standard deviation. Standard error is a fancy term for standard deviation in the slope. Okay, So here is the standard error in uh, this is the y-intercept, and x variable 1, we could rename slope if we wanted. This we could rename the y-intercept. Fancy statistics names for what we otherwise know as the y-intercept and the slope. And this we could really, if we wanted, we could say this is the absolute uncertainty. And this is just the value itself, if we want, we could rename these things. Not needed, but we, you know, it's an option for us. So the uncertainty in the slope is this thing here. Now I know when I go to report my uncertainty in slope in the lab report, I have to round it to the first sig fig. This first zero is not a sig fig. This first zero is not a sig fig. The first zero is the five here. So I will have to round to that digit, and it'll round up to 0.06, because the next digit is five or higher. It's a nine. M1. That's the measured mass of CART1, which is just this. Uncertainty in M1, well, it was measured with a device whose uncertainty was 0.05, plus or minus 0.05. And look at all these funny decimal places. I'll have to fix the decimal places in a second. M2 is, oh, I haven't found it. This is experimental M2, okay? And this is the uncertainty in M2 experimental. <coughs> okay, we are on our way. Here, what's the experimental value for M2? Well, you may recall there's an equation we derive in which you will derive in your report. The equation says, hmm, it says M2 experimental is equal to the slope, slope times the measured M1 minus the measured M1. So what's the value for my M2 experimental, right? What is M2 experimental? I could just paste that in like this. Well, <coughs> uh, what's the value? It's equal to the slope, which is this, times m1, which is this, minus m1, which is that. So 952, let me add some decimal places, see if I have, yes, I do have decimal places. So 951.699 is my experimental value of m2, and let's see, how that compares. What's my actual M2? Well, M2 represents the combined mass of the cart and the block. So look at that. That's not so bad. That's pretty close. Those are pretty close to each other, right? Okay, and this is, I, everything is being rounded. The uncertainty in M2, I'm going to find down here. So M2 experimental is this, what I just calculated. The uncertainty, we had an equation big uh, complicated equation we derived, which said it's m, the slope, times m1, times the uncertainty in slope over the slope, plus the uncertainty in m1 over m1, close parentheses, plus m1, delta m1, the uncertainty in m1, like that. There's my uncertainty in my experimental m2. So, this is kind of a redundant uh, work, uh, workbook here, a redundant sheet because I have, you know, this is the same as this, 
this is the same as this, but that's okay. It's redundant, but that's okay. And let me again just take away all this rounding that's happening. Let me add a bunch of decimal places. So what's the uncertainty in M2 actual? Well, I found M2 actual by adding cart1 and cart2. And, oh, sorry, excuse me, by adding cart2 and block. I added those to get M2 actual. If I add two measurements with uncertainty, then the golden rule of uncertainties is that the new value, right, which I get from summing these, that new value, which is this, has uncertainty equal to the sum of the absolute uncertainties. So the absolute uncertainty in this plus the absolute uncer uncertainty in this gives me the absolute uncertainty in M2 actual. In other words, 0 0.05 plus 0 0.05, 0 0.1. And that absolute uncertainty is only allowed to have one sig fig, so I round to the first sig fig, which is the one, that digit. And then I look at my value here for M2 actual, and I say, well, the value must have, it must be precise to the same place as its uncertainty. The uncertainty is rounded to one sig, fi uh, one sig fig, which puts it in the tenths place. So I come up to M actual, and I take away that extra decimal place, so now they are ra rounded to the same place. They are precise to the same place. Likewise, this can only have one sig fig. Oh my gosh, 31, and I keep going. I have to change it by hand to 30, rounded to one sig fig. The first sig fig is what I round to, which is the three, that digit. And this M2 experimental must be precise to the same place as its uncertainty, so it's going to get rounded to 950. And let me take off the extra decimal places. Okay then, very, very good. Now, each of these values, right, here are my values, they're not equal to each other, clearly. But each of them has a range set forth by the uncertainty here. So I'm going to calculate for each the upper limit, so it's the value plus the uncertainty, and the lower limit, which is the value minus the uncertainty, and I'll do the same thing here, the value plus the uncertainty, uh-oh, and then the value minus the uncertainty, and let me make sure that these have the right number of sig figs. Each of these uh, should match the precision of these first two values, so there we go, we're good. These should likewise match the precision of these. And look at that. The upper limit of M2 experimental is 980 grams, right, grams. I should probably add grams, uh-oh. So 980 grams is the upper limit of the experimental value. But that's still less than the lower limit of my actual M2. See, there's still, there's still, I haven't bridged the gap between these two ranges. So these two ranges, this range and this range, do not overlap. They don't share any common numbers. So what that means is that my experimental M2 does not agree with my actual M2. I mean, they're pretty close, you know, so what can I conclude? Well, I probably have more uncertainty than this accounts for. You know, sometimes we take, <laughs> look at this, this is great. Sometimes we don't take the, uh, we don't take this, the standard error, the standard deviation, as our uncertainty. Sometimes we say the uncertainty is twice the standard deviation. Like, if I double this, right, equals two times. Now, let's see what that does. Well, that raises my uncertainty here to 61, right? This gets raised up to 61, or really 60, because one sig fig. And now they agree. Oh, isn't that nice? Okay, but we're not using that. Instead, we're using just the standard deviation. But the point is, you know, what, would, what do we conclude? What do we conclude from the fact that the experimental and actual values disagree? What I would tend to conclude is that I'm underestimating the uncertainty when I say that the uncertainty is 30, right? That's probably an underestimate. And this is probably small. That's probably not a very accurate representation of the true uncertainty in this value. Because what if the mass balance that I use to measure these masses, what if that mass balance had a higher uncertainty than 0.05? It's old. It might be uh, rusted, or maybe it's miscalibrated over the years, or maybe, you know, it's just, maybe I misread something. Operator, human error, operator error. So there's a lot of things that can increase the uncertainty beyond the values that I have here. And maybe I, you know, maybe that's what I conclude. Okay, percent error is the difference between the experimental and actual values divided by the actual value, right, like that. Oh, it's negative, so let me just, I just 
we take the absolute value, so I'll just do ABS absolute value. And that's supposed to be a percentage. Look, I haven't multiplied by percent a hundred I haven't multiplied by a hundred in my formula bar because I'm just gonna come up here and change this to a percent. And when I click this percent button, it'll make it five point nine. Or a six, I'll make it five point nine. Percent uncertainty. What's the percent uncertainty in M2 experimental? Because I have to report these, both of these, in my report. I have to uh, state them both. The percent uncertainty, well, any percentage uncertainty, is the absolute uncertainty divided by the value, like that. And again, I'm going to make it a percentage, increase decimal places. And just to be clear then, since I'm calling this percentage uncertainty, I should be clear and call this then the absolute uncertainty. Because those two things are different. Right? The delta sign, the the yeah, the triangle represents absolute uncertainty. And we don't have a symbol for percentage uncertainty. Sometimes I call it delta percent. I make that up. And look, that's pretty much everything we need from here. So what do I copy? Well, I make sure that my chart has proper labels on the axes with units and so forth. Um, I give it a chart title, and I want to copy this into my final report. I want to copy the graph. I need my data tables, this one and this one. And I don't really need this. And I don't really need this either. These were just to help me get through the calculations, and I don't need that. So if you'd like to find a way to like include this, if you want to include a graph like this, that's perfectly fine. And then you just will go ahead and discuss it anyway. You know, this doesn't replace a this this graph as uh, I this table right here would not replace a discussion of these values or of the uh, agreement in your report. You would still have to discuss it, but if you want to refer to it, if that makes it easier for you, then that's perfectly acceptable.